Greetings, Michael Nay here, editor and publisher of Eco Village Voice. Welcome to another podcast. Today we are with Lois Arkin and Diana Leaf Christian in conversation on the 26th of June 2020. Hello everyone and thank you again Diana and Lois for coming here this morning. Well for me it's morning and for you it's near the end of the day. Uh, late afternoon yeah. for me and evening for Diana. Well then I will say welcome to those who are with us. My name is Diana Leaf Christian. I'm a um, researcher about eco-villages and other kinds of intentional communities and an advocate for them and I write about them. I've written two books about them and I write for Communities Magazine in the U.S. and I teach various things now online as compared to in person having to do with eco-villages and intentional communities and it is my great great privilege today to interview Lois Arkin who is the founder of Los Angeles Eco Village. Some of you will have read the uh, description of Los Angeles Eco Village, and some of you may not have seen it. So Lois, would you be willing to tell about the two block neighborhood, the 40 intentional neighbors, and just get a kind of a quick visual overview of what Los Angeles Eco Village looks like and is, and then we'll start the sequential questions where we're, we'll see how you all created it since 1992. Okay, well, I'm delighted to do that. I, um, I hope that it'll just roll off like I'm saying it for the first time, and let me see if I can give it a good, good go-to. The Los Angeles Eco Village is a place name for our two-block neighborhood which is consists of Bimini and White House Place. It's kind of a lopsided T with White House being a dead end street. On those two blocks, there are 13 multifamily buildings. Uh, among our nonprofit development organizations, three of those multifamily buildings are owned by, uh, under the control of LA Eco Village developers. And uh, the rest are a market rate. And uh, the ones that we control are permanently affordable. And we'll talk more about that later. About 500 people live in these two blocks. About 60 of those 500 live in buildings that are owned by Eco Village developers. And, uh, and that includes the people that lived in the buildings when we acquired them because we never required anyone to relocate out of the buildings. It's in the north end of the neighborhood known as Koreatown, uh, also a neighborhood known as East Hollywood, also a neighborhood known as Rampart Village. So uh, it's kind of like whatever your interests are, you can kind of say uh, where we are according to what your interests are. Uh, let me see, the intentional community here consists of about 40 people that live primarily in two of the three buildings, that multifamily buildings that we own. We have uh, three different boards of directors, uh, and it goes on from there. Our vision overall for LA Eco Village is to reinvent how we live in the city by essentially uh, demonstrating higher quality living patterns at lower environmental impacts. Now, that is a, a thing that most eco villages around the world say pretty much the same thing. We want higher quality living, lower impacts. And we do that here in LA Eco Village by connecting the dots between and among the social, the economic, and the ecological systems of the neighborhood. That is sometimes a challenge for people that are just getting with us, but we kind of trained ourselves in the beginning to think about everything that we do, how it has social, economic, and ecological impacts to some extent. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Thank you very much. It sounds like what you're saying, Lois, is that rather than being a group of people who bought some land together in an urban area and started a new eco village from scratch, you and your organizations, plural, slowly acquired three very close to each other buildings, two of them adjacent, one right across the street on a T intersection, a very urban part of Los Angeles, and that you are learning and practicing social sustainability, ecological sustainability, and economic sustainability there in a very urban setting. Do We're I working on it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> just so everyone will know, these are more aspirations than they are done deals where it's all finished. And just for a little context, both Lois and I are in the U.S. Can you tell by how we're talking? Probably you could. And um, so I live in a very, very rural eco-village called Earth Haven Eco-Village. It's on 329 acres in the forested mountains of Western North Carolina, not too far from Asheville, North Carolina. And we are learning social sustainability, economic sustainability, ecological sustainability, and we have classes and workshops and tours, just like LA Eco Village does. And we are teaching people what we're learning as we go along. As we are learning what works and <clears throat> what doesn't work, we're sharing that with people on our tours and in our classes and our workshops. So we have an educational mission, rural. LA Eco Village has an educational mission, urban. So that's a little bit of background on us too. Let me just say that us too <laughs> is the name of our housing co-op and it stands for Urban Soil Tierra Urbana, us too. Right, Urban Soil is the English version of that phrase. What a good name for an urban community. And Tierra Urbana, or rather Tierra Urbana. So anyway, that's the Spanish name of the very same thing. And so if you make a initials out of it, it's us too. And I didn't even mean to say that, but I did. So, <laughs> Let's start with the very first question that I would like to share with um, our viewers, which is that you and your forming group worked for 10 whole years straight looking for some raw land in Los Angeles. And you were going to start an eco village once you could find the raw land in Los Angeles, but you hadn't found any after the end of 10 years. And that's not uncommon in large cities. Then was the Rodney King event in Los Angeles, the horrible verdict where the cop that beat him up on camera, we all saw it, was let off scot-free. And then there was protests and riots right in your very own neighborhood. And that changed everything regarding the course of your plans. Would you please share what it changed and what you did differently at that point? Well, it's interesting because uh, the site that we were spent the 10 years planning for and going out and doing some community organizing and working with some of our city uh, planners and particularly the head of the city planning department at that time, who was a dear friend uh, to us, although he was appointed by the mayor. He really, really liked our vision for what we wanted to do. And we were able, he would arrange things for us to go downtown and speak to all the heads of the different departments and about our vision for an eco village. And we ended up being written into the city's housing policies, which is part of the, of the general plan for the city. So we had, a, we had a presence there. And we also, during those 10 years, I was kind of going off at the mouth about it all the time. And so we had, a, <laughs> and also I think, thanks to you, Diana, we had some articles in Communities Magazine and we had some articles in some other progressive newspapers and magazines, and even remember a big feature article in the LA Times. And particularly the co-housing movement actually got started when we had a fe feature article on co-housing in front of the building that we now own, which we had no idea in the whole world that we would ever own it. However, uh, that said, the fires were, I lived on this block for 13 years at the time of those uprisings. And those, uh, we had five fires within two blocks, major fires. We should explain to viewers that they weren't fires because of fires that just got started because of lightning strikes or somebody didn't turn off their stove. This was because of the protests, which in those days were actually riots in 1992. And so there was destruction in riots in those days and the fires were set. And there you were in a neighborhood with five fires going on. But at any rate, that weekend, the, uh, the uprisings, the protests, the fires, uh, the demonstrations, they happened on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. By Saturday and Sunday, people were either leaving town in droves or planning to, or all, many people from the suburbs coming into LA to sweep up and clean up. And what I did have a choice of what I was gonna do that weekend, 
Uh, forgot to mention, during the, that 10-year period, we had a volunteer architect that did a 50-page feasibility study for the 11-acre site that we had thought we were going to build this very sexy new development on. So I took that 50-page feasibility study and reduced it to four pages of bullet points. And they were specifically about how you would do retrofit of a built-out urban neighborhood. And that was Saturday and Sunday. On Monday, I called my 20-person planning committee together, and we began a six-month dialogue around the question, what should our priorities be in inner city Los Angeles? Should we be building this $50 million? Who knows where that money is going to come from? Or should we be seriously thinking about a retrofit of a neighborhood that was deeply affected by these uprisings? And so for six months, that's what we talked about. And then by December, it was like unanimous. Oh, let's just do it in Lois's neighborhood, since I had already lived here for 13 years. And also, the other thing is, in, from my perspective, you always want to do these kinds of things in a place where you are known or where you have reached out to your neighbors. That is a very big mistake that a lot of intentional communities have made. And uh, we'll hear about that. Uh, so it was unanimous. I was very enthusiastic. And on January 1st, 1993, we hit the streets. I was the only one who lived here intentionally. And volunteers would come in two and three times a week. And we walked the streets, getting to know neighbors, getting to know the kids, and doing a lot of like really little things that were bonding the community together. Uh, it was interesting because kind of like we had our first meeting maybe in February or March and not too many people came, but we asked them, what are the strengths and weaknesses of our neighborhood? And mostly all people wanted to talk about was crime. And what we knew was that crime is symptomatic of the breakdown of community and the fear of crime is certainly much more debilitating than crime itself. And if we were a conventional community development organization, we would just have organized a community neighborhood watch. But we knew what we needed to do was to develop community. And so that's what we did for the next three years till we bought our first building, mostly working with kids, getting to know them, their families, connecting people who were frightened of one another. Uh, after six months, we had another community meeting, asked people what the strengths and weaknesses were of the neighborhood. And crime came on the third page of the brainstorm list. And it came as an afterthought. Oh, yeah, we still have to think about crime. We had implemented something I later began to call positive gossip. When we were walking the streets, two and three times a week with our volunteers. We'd learn everything we could about people and then gossip about them to other neighbors, all the nicest things that we were learning about them so that they would be excited about meeting their neighbors. And then we'd have community events and they'd come out and be happy to be meeting their neighbors. So that's the, that was our raw beginnings. <laughs> my, I would say it was really the happiest time of my 27-year history, even though I there have been other happy times, but it was really a, a lovely time. <laughs> so just to um, summarize, you had not bought any property yet after the six months when you decided you were going to live where you already lived and create a neighborhood in the neighborhood where you already lived. You lived in a duplex apartment that you rented on the corner of that same T intersection. You didn't own the building you lived in, you were a renter. And the visits and meetings that you had were either in your front yard or in your rented house. You and some of the people who were gonna co-found Los Angeles Eco Village with you walked up and down those two streets and you met your neighbors and there were so many of them because there were multifamily dwellings there, apartment buildings. At that time, I believe this was a neighborhood of many Korean speaking immigrants from Korea and their first generation and second generation kids and grandkids, Hispanic people speaking Spanish, not Koreans and not Spanish white looking people and African-Americans 
Do I have that right? A few minor adjustments. Uh, it was a fourplex, not a duplex, and it was quite large, a large two-bedroom um, uh, apartment within a fourplex, and it was owned by the Los Angeles Unified School District. The population was not very many Koreans, even, and we weren't even called Koreatown at that time yet. Oh. There was a lot of Korean businesses, but mostly Koreans lived in uh, out suburbs and so forth, and then they would come in for their businesses, which was one of the issues that uh, at the base of the uprisings, because there were all these Korean store owners in the African-American communities, and the two cultures didn't understand one another. Some really wonderful things came out of that in terms of relationships between African-Americans and Koreans. So, so that went fine. And, and now today, the neighborhood is getting uh, more substantially, much more substantially Korean as people move back into town. And as those second and third generations, the young Koreans, I mean, this is a, like a really happening neighborhood for young Koreans. So... And I think you mean Korean Americans because they talk like you and me and they would say they're American if you ask them. And of course they are. I would like to tell people listening, we're talking with Lois Arkin about Los Angeles Eco Village in California, in the U.S. Uh, one of the most well-known and longest, 27 years old, urban eco villages in the world. There's a few other in the U.S., a few other urban eco villages. But Lois Arkin in LA Eco Village is the first. When I visit there, and I must have visited by now about seven or eight times, I think, over the many years, I consider it a place that is the most multicultural, multiracial, multi everything you can think of any community I have ever seen in the US or Canada or Europe. When I was doing my first workshop there, it was just for LA Eco Village residents. It wasn't for the general public at that time. And all around the room, there were, were people whose ancestors had come from one of every single continent, except not Antarctica. All the other continents were represented by the face and the name and the accent and the everything of the person who was in the room. And I just thought, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the world. And then I thought, and this is how I wish intentional community was everywhere. So when I go visit now and I walk down the halls, I hear a lot of Spanish being spoken. It's the second other language there. And uh, because I know a little bit of Spanish, I can sort of understand what's going on. And it's really, really fun for me to go visit. You have lived there all this time, but you have not left. You didn't run screaming away from the place the way many founders do, because it gets to be sometimes so hard to live in community. And sometimes it's been really hard for you because in the earlier days, there were really big conflicts. Although LA Eco Village has got really good systems in place now, like membership, community governance, and having a clear mission and purpose. But in some of the times that you were there, it was really hard to be there for you and for others, because sometimes communities like that until they learn what they can do to make life more pleasant. So why did you stay and do you have any advice for people who are considering community living? <laughs> well, <clears throat> uh, I stayed, I think it had to do with, quote, trauma of my childhood, when my, <laughs> uh, of my childhood and adolescence and young adulthood, when my mother kept harping on me all the time, honey, you have no stick to Aha. Uh -huh. And after... <laughs> Very uh, interestingly, after I was doing this for about 20 or 30 years, my mother said, honey, when are you going to get a job? When are you going to get a real job? <laughs> so, I think in the first three years, I didn't know that I was going to persevere. I said to myself, I'm going to give a three-year commitment and then we'll see. And after three years, I made a further commitment. I think the sense of it is that the work isn't done. The vision isn't anywhere near fully manifested. And what I really appreciate is being invited to so many other communities. If I decide to escape, there's uh, Earth Haven to go to, and there's this one to go to, and so forth. In spite of all of its problems, I love Los Angeles, and I love cities. I like rural areas too, but I love this city and I have a lot of reasons to stay and continue to make it happen. It's just a matter of persevering and, uh, ha and keeping that stiff upper lip 
as my father used to say, keep a stiff upper lip. And <laughs> I don't want to know what's going to happen. And also, here's the other thing. As we improved our membership process, and I got on the membership committee with several other people, I realized I could have a lot to say about our future residents. But as it turns out, I don't have a lot to say about them <laughs> because it's, it's essentially a paper pushing job. <laughs> but I do do the tours and I meet a lot of people. And I think that it's, uh, that's, it's exciting to be here. That's, I think, why I've stayed. And, because, and after you came and straightened out the mess I had made of things for the first uh, 10 or 12 years and helped us really get on the right track about our membership process, about our meeting process, and so forth, uh, things just continually got better. We created a, a conflict resolution team. Everyone was trained and certified, and things became congenial, whereas we went through that like eight-year period or so when things were not congenial, where you really saw the worst of it. So today we have quite a congenial uh, membership. What's wonderful about it is I can intensely disagree with people here in our meetings and in other in discussions in the hall. And yet at the end of the day, at the end of the meeting, the congeniality is there. Even hugs are there from people you were at each other's throats about a few minutes ago in a meeting. For me, that was the bottom line. We had to agree to disagree, and no matter how bad things got or how contentious they got, we had to remain congenial with one another. And so, why not stay? So, could you give us the brief version of how you purchased your first and second buildings? Because there were buildings that Los Angeles Eagle Village controlled but didn't yet own. So how did you do that back in, was it 95 or 96? 95, 96, 99, 2010, 2012, 2016, because we actually own or control four properties. Uh, wait, one, two, three, four, five properties now, one of which we don't own, but we manage. In the mid 80s, uh, my organization, then known as CRISP, CRSP, the Cooperative Resources and Services Project, we're rebranding to Los Angeles Eco Village Institute, so you'll be hearing more about that in the future. But CRISP wanted to, to kind of experiment with different kinds of economic systems. So we created a local currency, then known as the Local Exchange Trading System, or LETS, and we also created an ecological revolving loan fund known as ELF. And that was the best thing we ever did. We went to a lot of our friends and said, loan us some money, we'll invest the money in a socially responsible uh, mutual fund that at that time it was working assets, which most of you will be familiar with. And then we'll get interest on that and we'll pass that interest uh, uh, through to you. And then we'll uh, see if anyone wants to start some small green businesses and then we'll have money to help them do that. And so that's how the ELF started. You know, it was interesting because we published a hard copy quarterly newsletter at that time. We would often put out, okay, anyone want to start a business? Uh, let me know. We got money. People would come and they say, yeah, Lois, I want to start a business. Can I get a loan? And I would say, well, find at least two other people that want to do what you want to do, and then start meeting. And every time you meet, put a little money, have everyone put a little money aside, five, 10, whatever they can afford, and have someone keep track of that and do all your meetings, make out your business plan. And we can help you with that or find people that can help you with that. Come back in six months and we'll see about a loan. And do you think anyone ever came back? Zero. And that was my most important lesson. I knew then that there is money out there to be had. So in 1995, uh, when we got wind of the fact that this 40-unit building was in default on the way to foreclosure across the street from where I lived, I said, oh, well, we've just got to buy it. And so we grew our loan fund. We went out to everyone that we knew, did personal outreach, did a, I think, a 20 or 30-page prospectus you know, like a business plan about what we needed, how much we needed, what kind of money, when, 
how it was going to be paid back, what the vision was for what we wanted to do, and all that sort of thing. It was very professional. How did I do that? I knew another nonprofit developer and borrowed his business plan and just adapted it to what we wanted to do, and it worked. And people saw that it looked very professional and so forth, and so they loaned us money. Now, we only would borrow money from people that we knew, and that way we could, uh, they were more like handshake loans. Probably the 40 or 50 loans we've had over the years, I think we only ever recorded one loan, and that was short-term from someone we didn't know, and that was the last time we ever did that. So the loans were anywhere mostly from $2,500 to $100,000. We had a six-page loan agreement that I proudly prepared. And when one lender wanted to loan us $100,000, he cut it down to a half a page. So that's the one we've been using ever since. And you can see it on our website, laecovillage.org. I think we have both a copy of the, the information sheet on the loan fund and the loan agreement. So anyone that needs that or wants it, uh, you can find it easily or uh, write me and uh, I'm easy to find. <laughs> so we've raised probably close to $2 million and we paid cash on all of our properties. We paid $500,000 for our first building of 40 units, $315 for our second building of eight units, and $650,000 for our third building of four units. Of course, uh, this was over a 20 year period. And then our most recent acquisition is a commercial property, an old auto shop, and we paid $1,139,000 for that and are in the process of echo retrofitting the building. And we have a vision for it, which we'll talk about later. Yes, thank you. I just would like to make something more clear. In the communities movement, we began to refer to what Ella Eco Village had done as a revolving loan fund. And Lois taught Tree Bresson, a co-founder of Walnut Street Co-op in Eugene, Oregon, how to do it. And then Tree wrote up How You Do a Revolving Loan Fund, which appeared in Communities Magazine. And I grabbed that article, revised it a little bit, and put it in my first book, Creating a Life Together. And I have been sharing how you do this with people in my workshops and webinars ever since. So some things that Lois, you didn't say, which I think are very significant. Correct me if I'm wrong, Lois, but these people did not get interest. No, they did. They did. In the beginning, they could choose their own interest anywhere from zero to, I believe, 6%. Now we're, our interest rates are only at 1.5%. The interest is paid out quarterly. So this is what's different between us and a lot of other oh. nonprofits. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. Yes. In Tree's article, she said that. But what she said, which I meant to say, is there was no collateral. They had to know you, like you, trust you, care about your values and vision and mission and what you were going to accomplish. And when they wanted to get their money out again, they got their money out at the end of the term length. And the new person would revolve in, which is why it got called a revolving loan. The interest rates were low. There wasn't anything to foreclose because there wasn't any collateral. These were loans from friends based on a lot of trust. Well, Tree and her several friends in Eugene, Oregon, bought their 10-bedroom double house house on two lots in the university section of Eugene, Oregon, a very nice place. I've been there too. So the revolving loan fund that either you innovated or somehow had a whole lot to do with promoting has been beneficial for the community's movement ever since then, Lois. Well, that makes me feel really good. But you know what? I think that a lot of communities were kind of doing this sort of thing, borrowing money from their friends, but maybe not having a formal name and promoting it uh, amongst other people that weren't directly connected with their particular communities. So the revolving loan fund is one thing that was very important is that we did pay out the interest quarterly. So nothing compounded or we would never be able to afford that. So always it's simple interest. The other aspect of it being revolving is that it's revolving from one building into another. So the two initial buildings that we bought comprising 48 units of housing, 40 in one building, eight in the second building, eventually my organization, Chris, sold those two buildings to the uh, co-op, us to the Urban Soil Tier. 
So I can't rule. I cannot trill my R's. Tierra Ivana, uh, a housing co-op. And so Chris holds the mortgages for those two buildings. And then that money is revolving into, to a large extent, into the uh, commercial property that we purchased in 2016, the old auto shop. And the same thing with the fourplex that we bought across the street. That was also part of revolving out of the fourplex into the property that we bought on the corner. So it, it's complicated, and a couple of our members are trying to create a video that uh, depicts what the whole financial structure is on how we did this. Now, the other thing I want to mention is not only did we, did we sell these buildings to the co-op at way, way below market rates, uh, but we divided the ownership of the buildings from the ownership of the land. My organization, CRISP, donated the land to the land trust, known as the Beverly Vermont Community Land Trust. Co-op pays land rent to the land trust. And the land trust has, as part of their mission, to do more, more affordable housing in the immediate neighborhood. We do have a question. What oh, yeah. decision-making process do you use? Oh, great. From the very beginning, a <clears throat> little background here, I was on the board of the uh, then Fellowship for Intentional Communities, now Foundation for Intentional Communities, for quite a few years back in the late 80s to early 90s. And I would go to their meetings and they made decisions by consensus and I would sit there five days spellbound. Oh, for sure, we're going to make decisions by consensus too. But I didn't know Diana that well at that time, or even at all when we began. And so what happened, of course, was I immediately decided that we would make decisions by consensus, no training, nothing. And then what essentially is I gave away all of my authority, all of my power to the group. And they didn't know w, what is it WTF they were doing. <laughs> and, um, and that's how we ultimately got into some terrible problems that uh, Diana helped fit, uh, considerably. So we today, after actually two or did we have three sociocracy trainings with Diana, there are several people here that understand sociocracy, but we are still not practicing it, I'm sorry to say but we have gotten a whole lot better at practicing uh, consensus. And people do get trained in it when they come in. Uh, someone always gives them some basic training. I think that we deal with far too much minutia and I'd like to see us do a lot more delegating and a lot more sociocratic decision-making. So hopefully that'll happen in the future. We do have several committees and committees make decisions of their own and then bring them to the plenary. And sometimes the plenary does delegate some decision-making authority to the committees. Well, I would like to say a few things about that. I like to distinguish between what I call classic traditional consensus. I used to call it in my magazine article series in Communities Magazine, I used to call it consensus with unanimity, meaning trying to make the point that we all have to agree except for those who stand aside from the decision. And then we go forward with the proposal or if somebody blocks it, it stops dead in its tracks right then and there, bang, dead, gone. And so I now call that older form of consensus classic traditional consensus. And that is the kind of consensus that Los Angeles Eco Village was using when I first started visiting them. And they had some fairly serious conflicts at the time as a result of that. It wasn't because there, there was anything wrong with them, and it wasn't because there's anything wrong with classical traditional consensus. It's just that classic traditional consensus requires certain requirements to use it and almost no intentional community that I know of in this universe or the Delta Quadrant or the Alpha Quadrant of the universe actually meets those criteria to use it. So there's often quite a lot of conflict and there was at that time at LA Eco Village. Another kind of consensus I now advocate instead, which I call modified consensus, and my favorite kind of modified is something I call the in-street consensus method, which I got from the great folks at In Street Co-Housing in Davis, California. Why is their name In Street? Because they're on a street called the letter N, 
and um, just near the street called M and not too far from O, P, and Q. That's Davis, California for you. They have letter street names. So I think that what I did was share with you all ways to have a in-street consensus-like modification and then your consensus process got better. I think also I said, please don't even let any new members have any decision-making rights until they get trained in your consensus method and they know how to use it. They understand what blocking is, they understand what supporting a proposal is, and standing aside is they understand the role of a participant in puzzles, agendas, and the facilitator. And they did uh, listen to me and they listened to the consensus trainers that they brought in to train them, including Tree Bresson, who I mentioned earlier, who lives not that far up the west coast of the U.S. in Oregon. And now I teach sociocracy, which is a whole system governance process that includes, but is not limited to the decision making. It is not like voting. It's not like majority rule or supermajority voting. It's not like consensus it has the benefits of the best of consensus, but none of the downfalls. And so when you said, Lois, that, well, I'd like us to use more sociocracy-like processes, I have to tell you that it's a little bit like binary either or. It's a little hard to use a little of sociocracy and have it work. It's really hard to combine it with consensus and have it work and not be filled with conflict. It's better to just use it as it is or else not. Kind of like if you had a language like Mandarin Chinese and you wanted to mix it with French. Neither the French would be able to understand you, nor the people who spoke Mandarin would be able to understand you. You really need to learn and use one or the other of those two unrelated languages. That's why I'm kind of going, oh, well, <laughs> I, I, I hope that there will come a day when some of your committees might use sociocracy, but because I'm a trainer of it, I'd like to say, please either use the whole enchilada or don't. <laughs> and if you don't, please use the in-street consensus method because it's so much better than the classic traditional method. Thank you for whoever asked that question. Okay, the nonprofit that you started, Chris, got the uh, Eco Village going in the 1990s, and you helped get both the housing co-op and the land trust started. You separated out ownership of the land underneath two of the apartment buildings, which is owned by the land trust, which you and others there started. And then the buildings themselves, the two apartment buildings, are owned by the housing co-op, Urban Soil Tierra Urbana. Now I'm going to show off Tierra Urbana. How about that? And no. um, yeah, well, I can do that, but I practiced in high school. And so the deal is, wow, how come Los Angeles Eco Villages has one legal entity that owns the land and the other that owns the buildings? Well, that was a very big lesson that I learned in the early 1980s or even before that when I started studying about co-ops and started studying about Los Angeles and co-ops. And I learned that there were several co-ops in Los Angeles in the 1940s and 50s, and they were uh, substantially supported by federal mortgages. They were affordable for the length of the mortgage people had to income qualify. But when the mortgages were paid off 30 and 40 years later, all of a sudden the people living in those co-ops because they were there for economic purposes primarily, even though they might have developed good relations with their neighbors, but they said, oh, we own the building now free and clear. We can sell it for whatever we want and then take off to wherever we want to take off to. And so they did. My passion was to create permanently affordable housing. And so by separating the ownership of the land from the ownership of the buildings, that made kind of another layer that would make that sort of thing that those other 40s and 50s co-op owners did, that would make that very, very difficult to do. However, I do want to say this. No matter how many layers of bureaucracy that one might want to make to ensure that your vision is carried out over the long term, ultimately, the only thing that really secures that vision, because no matter what you've organized, they can pay some high-priced attorney to do anything that you want them to do. Look at what's going on in Washington right now. Oh, never mind. Don't, don't look at it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but the big thing is 
the, the ultimate thing that secures your vision is the culture of the community. And it took from 1996 to 2012 to secure that culture, both the congeniality of the culture and also because so they don't end up suing each other. Uh, and number two, the permanent affordability for people to understand, hey, we do this not just for ourselves, but for future generations as well. They got that. And then it was fine to transfer ownership. Oh, boy. Well, thank you for answering that um, kind of fascinating question to my mind. Um, let's go with the question that Ruth is asking. Uh, you mentioned that now you have a, mem a good membership process and so many things that were challenging before, such as your decision-making process and people with various scary and bad habits and bad behaviors and dreadful attitudes sometimes join because you had no membership process, zero zilch. And now you do have one. So could you explain how you approve new members, but before approve new members? But before you do, I want to say something to our folks who might be considering co-housing in the U.S. or Australia or wherever you might be listening from, which is that in the U.S. and the U.K. and Canada, where I know co-housing pretty well, the legal entity with which you own the land, in at least Canada and the U.S., you cannot choose your new incoming members because you would be violating federal laws if you said no thank you to someone because they had behavioral issues or scary attitudes or they seem like they didn't want to understand community or what you were doing. But in the UK, you can, or at least a few years ago up till then, you could. The UK co-housers would tell me this. LA Eco Village is owned in such a way that you can approve new members because in every state in the US and I believe every province in Canada, and I guess our Australian friends will tell us how it is there, a housing co-op is the only legal entity, at least in the US, where you can say yes to some members and no thank you to others because maybe they don't want to pay what you ask them in dues and fees or they don't understand community or they don't support your values and your vision and your mission or because they're not willing to agree to the agreements you've already agreed to and they're going to break all your own rules and cause lots of trouble. Now that you all know that, that you can't say yes or you can say no or you can say not at this time or you could could say, could you please go learn NBC first or something like that? Could you tell the step-by-step -step of your now very thorough membership process? I'll try to uh, keep it summarized, but I do want to say, and what caused those problems in the beginning was my naivete. I would say to people that were interested in being members, if they could agree that they wanted to live more cooperatively and more ecologically, hey, they were in. And that was all we required. And oh, maybe pass a credit check. And even if they didn't have good credit, we'd work it out with them. So that was my big boo-boo in the beginning. Now what we do, we have membership process that generally takes about six months. And it's in three phases. The first phase is the interested phase. Either they found us on the internet or through a friend or word of mouth or something, and they have come on a tour and they write our membership committee, which is clearly indicated in, on our website under contact. Pull it down and see who to write to if you want to be a member. Uh, then we send them uh, an outline, about a couple page outline of what our process is about and including a link to a 25 item personal questionnaire that we ask them to fill out. So when they fill out the questionnaire, sometimes they're so, they, you know, that's enough and uh, well, thanks, but no thanks. They fill out the questionnaire, send it back to the membership committee. Membership committee puts it up on a hidden page on our wiki. So only our members can see it because there's a lot of personal information on it. And then we invite them to come to one of our Monday night meetings and announce that they're interested. Maybe they'll have five minutes on the agenda and say a little bit about themselves. And then we assign them a liaison that helps them through the membership process. And they're responsible for getting to know everyone in the community. So they can discover if they're a good fit for the community and if the community is a good fit for them. So those are our two most important things other than other, you know, kind of basic stuff uh, as well. But so they uh, hang out. They cannot live here while they're in this process. And we ask them to come to our Monday night meetings, come to our Sunday night potlucks, attend some of our community meetings, some of our social events, some of our special events. So they can, over that two or three month period, get to know everyone. 
And after that, they and their liaison decide whether they're ready to come back to the community to be greenlit into the process. And then we decide that based on consensus. And uh, essentially, just because you didn't get to know someone very well is not a reason to block. And then they're in the process for another few months. And then when they and their liaison decide it's time to look at having them become a provisional member. And so the liaison comes back to the community meeting and asks for that to be on the agenda. And then when they, when they come to the meeting for that, usually they're going to be on the hot seat for about 20 to 30 minutes. And incidentally, when we green light them, they have to leave the room and the community decides whether they want to have them greenlit. And the same thing then when they're up for provisional membership, they leave the room and the community talks about it for 20 or 30 minutes, sometimes more. And then they find out whether once they're provisional, if we have a unit available, they can move into it. And then it's another six months before they can become a full member and another year after that, that they can then become an owner member. So you can see it's a little bit different than just say, oh, I want to live more cooperatively and more ecologically. And oh, baby, you're in. <laughs> but when we bought our building, it was half vacant. So we were you know, anxious to have it filled. Uh, but now we're full and we have been. And so membership committee is really talking about how we want to revise our membership process. There are some differences of opinion about that. If you want to learn more about what some of those differences are, I'm happy to talk about it. I'll just add one more thing. Of course, we get, as I'm sure a lot of other communities too, my lease is up or I'm moving to California and I'll be there in uh, September and I want to live there. And, you know, then you send them the information and never hear from them again sometimes. <laughs> I wanted to uh, quickly respond to two questions because I happen to know the answer to them and then we can ask you a question more specifically about the next things. So somebody said, what if you don't have the same shared values? And um, well, we find out about people's shared values with yours. If first of all, you tell them what they are on the website and when you and when when they and you are talking with each other and you're interviewing them and all that time is going by before they live there and then when they live there. I'm talking about membership process here too and in intentional communities in general, when you can do that, like when your legal entity with which you own the property allows you to do that, then you find out pretty quickly if they do or don't have the same shared values. And if they don't, you say no thank you. And usually though, they will say no thank you first. Usually they will leave. And in a moment, I'll ask Lois if that's been your experience there. As for the other one, I can answer that really quickly. Well, if it's a housing co-op, what do you own? There is housing co-op law in every one of the 50 states in the U.S., and I imagine in the states of Australia, and there is also in every province in Canada, and that's places I know, at least North American ones. And what you own is a certificate of share, either one share or several, depends on how your state or province sets it up. And uh, that's all you own. And you also have an occupancy agreement that's like a lease, but technically and legally it isn't one, but it's just like one, which lets you live in the house. So if you take a look at me here, I'm in a house. I'm in um, Persimmon Grove Neighborhood Housing Co-op, which is one of 10 neighborhoods in Earth Haven. Each one of us neighborhoods is a member of Earth Haven, and together we co-own all the rest of the land, which is in between our neighborhoods. What do I own? Well, I own a piece of paper that says share, and I have the legal right to live in this yellow house. And it's just exactly like I own it, but technically and legally all my neighbors own it and I own their house houses. So we all own all of it in our co-op, but it's like we own our own. At LA Eco Village, the people who live in the buildings who own their apartment own a share, or they might have it in LA, I mean, in California lost several shares that equals that square footage. And they've got an occupancy agreement or whatever it's called in California that lets them live there. Other people who are there in LA Eco Village in the same buildings are renting. Who are they renting from? Well, they're renting from the co-op. Renters and owners together are all members. The reason I said that myself fast is because I know a lot about co-op law compared to uh, before I knew anything. Not a lot like a lawyer does, but a lot more than I did before. And so the good thing about owning your community as a housing co-op is you can choose your members. 
the bad thing is it scares the heck out of some people to think that all they own is paper and not actual property, but it's as if they own property. Would you want to add anything to that? I want to distinguish between stock cooperatives that are market rate, so you can sell your shares for whatever you want and they go with the market. And oftentimes they're a little bit less expensive than condos or other kinds of housing. But limited equity housing cooperative is a way uh, in which the equity buildup is limited. In our case, it is so limited. I think it's limited to 02 of 1%, 0.20% interest per year, simple interest, so it can't accumulate either. So it's a very, very limited equity housing co-op. I also want to mention that we have a, a mixture amongst our members, which I think you indicated, of both renters and owners, and mostly now it is renters. We only have about a dozen owner members and the rest are renter members, but I see that more and more people are interested in being owner members, and so that's good. And then the co-op actually has its own board. I also might mention that the uh, land trust has a 99-year lease with the co-op, and the documents of both organizations mandate the permanent affordability. Good. Redundancy, a principle of permaculture. Exactly. I would, just, I would just like to mention to people that there's a big distinction between the way Los Angeles Eco Village uses a co-op and the way some other intentional communities do, which is that, for example, here at Earth Haven, we, the co-op of my neighborhood, own the land and the buildings all together. And at LA Eco Village, it's different, but it's not because the buildings are owned by a co-op. It's because they just split it to where one piece of the whole deal, the land and underneath the land, I guess, is owned by the land trust. And the building sitting on the land, the two adjacent apartment buildings, are owned by the co-op. And it can be different than that. When you have a co-op, you don't have to do it that way. We have a question. What is your pet policy? Oh, great question. A pet policy. We can uh, no dogs. We love dogs, most of us love dogs. Some people argue that we should have some dogs. Uh, we have a lot of cats. Our co a policy on cats is we'll take them in by a, on a case-by-case -case basis, but we've never refused anyone. And they have to be exclusively indoor cats or else on a leash when they're out with you. Uh, I think someone had a bird for a while, <laughs> uh, but that's it. I don't know if we, oh, we have chickens. We have, and people have a very close relationship with our chickens, uh, some of them, but they have a large enclosure that they are kept in. So we have chickens both in the courtyard of our big building and across the street in our quarter acre learning garden. So Lois, what are your personal visions you personally, Lois, not the whole place, but you, as what you would see at LA Eco Village ideally over the next 20 years. If you could be the queen of the universe, as it were, a little game I like to play, thought experiment game, and say, this is what I'd really like to see happen here, what would it be? Well, we actually do have a plan. Actually, we have a 2050 plan, quite frankly. And I'm very excited to say that our 2050 plan is being, we are being helped along with it by both an international engineering firm and an international architectural firm, which have done amazing things. The architectural firm did a charrette with us. That is a, a half-day design workshop out of which came this incredible booklet, which you can see, it is online, and I can send it to you online if anyone emails me, and you can email me, and I'll, I'll send it along to you. But from my perspective, uh, some of the things that are contained in uh, that uh, design workshop that we did, and many things that I've thought about for the last uh, 35 years, <clears throat> uh, we have hot mineral springs 2,000 feet under our street. Uh, so the idea of uh, re and for about 50 years, they were essentially what made this neighborhood. People came from all over the world 
to soak in our hot mineral springs. It, they were discovered when people were drilling for oil in our neighborhood and they didn't find oil. They found these hot mineral springs and up out of that uh, grew this wonderful spa. And that's what all these buildings were built to accommodate both the workers and the guests that came. To restore those hot mineral springs, yes, we have to, uh, there's a property that we have to buy where I know we can access them from because I have the original plans for where the pipes are and everything. <laughs> so, so that uh, also on our dead end block, it's about 800 feet long. And I intend to this year be working on taking over the parking lane on the north side of the street and the sidewalk and create an urban farm there. What's adjacent to it is not housing, but a parking lot owned by the school board. So we're not uh, really going to mess with anyone's housing or parking there. So that is important. The, of course, the most important thing is that our two streets become essentially car-free and truck-free. That's something that we've been working on for many years and we'll continue to work on. Hopefully we'll get some traction this year. The commercial property that is a quarter acre site adjacent to our large building on the north, we're in the process of essentially creating a community hub there that will have some small green businesses. But the most exciting part of that a vision is and plan now is to have an eco co-op hostel initially it was going to be for 20 people, conventional kind of hostel where people sleep really close together. But we've kind of ditched that idea since COVID-19 that we may never be having those kinds of projects again. But there's no reason why we couldn't cut it in half to tens sleeping spaces. And those sleeping spaces could be physically distanced tiny houses. And so we're getting delivery on our first tiny house at the end of August. It's being donated to us. So I'm very wow. excited about that. But that property also is a brownfield. What that means, a uh, brownfield means either the earth is contaminated or it's per perceived to be contaminated. In our case, it is contaminated. And so there are, and especially as we go more renewable energies and we stop using petroleum for our cars and our homes and so forth, there's going to be brownfields, thousands of brownfields all over the world, but certainly very much so in this city. And so I want neighborhoods to learn how to remediate the brownfields in their neighborhoods. So we're going to use this as a demonstration project. And we've hooked up right now with the UC Riverside and their Department of Environmental Toxicology. And so they're going to be doing research with us on remediating the brownfield, what's known as in situ, on site instead of just digging the earth up and hauling it away because there is no more away. How do we make it work where it is and not make it someone else's problem? In that respect, there's been tremendous research and success using fungi, microorganisms, and plants and trees. So we'll be uh, working on that too over the next few years. Of course, the most important thing is that we'll, within 50 years, hopefully 20, but certainly within 50, we'll have essentially all the rest of the buildings in the neighborhood will be in the land trust or at least uh, they'll, and that everyone, the 500 people that live in our two block neighborhood will identify as living in the Los Angeles eco village and the housing will increasingly become affordable as the land trust acquires uh, the properties and the communities. And there may be several co-housing communities within the two blocks, just like Earth Haven and Eco Village at Ithaca and so forth like that. So that's a little bit of the vision. Thank you so much, Lois, for kindly sharing all this wisdom with all of us. And before we go, one of our burning questions, which we can answer in two ways, is, okay, so what, how would we start an urban eco village? And Lois has two handouts. One is called My Advice to Others Planning to Start an Eco Village. Her original advice in 1991 and refined it three different times after that. And Confessions of an Eco Village Founder. Lessons Learned from Los Angeles Eco Village, which actually both of these appeared in Communities Magazine. And so there are urban eco villages in various countries, and they're very, very important in my opinion, and Lois's opinion, and anybody who lives in one, as well as all the other kind of communities that we're creating all over everywhere. 
So thank you so much, everybody, for watching and listening and putting up with our strange technology as we work it out. Do you have any parting words? And then we'll hang up and send virtual hugs. Well, yes, cyber hugs to you and to all of the people that stuck with us all this time. And uh, thank you. Please uh, email us and with any of your other questions. And if you want to come for a visit uh, in the post-COVID period, please let us know. We have a guest unit and we welcome visitors. We hope you have enjoyed this. So I think I'll say goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. And please visit ecovillagevoice.com and please share with your friends and colleagues.